tags, those tags um, uh, are for you to place on butterflies. And uh, just to give you an idea, Joyce used to have the kids um, catch them over the weekend, put them in an envelope, put them in the refrigerator, and then on Monday, bring them in and she could tag them on Monday and release them. It's kind of an interesting thing. They tell you all of this in the system. Um, they notice it says, don't use your fingers. The oil from your skin can prevent the tag. Originally, they used to fold the tags over the wing. Then they had um, IPUC things that you collude on. Now they've been using this system for a number of years and it's been working out very well. And here you can see where they tell you put the tag and it does not interfere with the butterfly's flight. Um, interestingly, about 1.5% of the tag butterflies recovered in Mexico or on their way to Mexico. So it's not a very high return. And that's why it's important to get large numbers tagged so that they can figure out what's going on. By means of these tags, they've been able to establish, and many of you might be familiar with the fact that all of these butterflies go down to the last generation, let me put it that way, the fourth or fifth generation, depending on where you are, they all turn around and go back to Mexico. And then they slowly work up generation by generation, as you can see in these arrows, up into Texas, up in uh, the middle states, across the middle of the country. And they generation upon generation makes it up to northern areas, and then they all go back down. You can also notice, interestingly, that there's a California population that had been decimated last year. This year, it's made a rebound, but it was very, very decimated last year. And you can see down in Florida that they're still trying to figure out exactly what happens. There seems to be some residents that stay down there all the time. Uh, in the uh, fall, this process has been reversed and you can see them working back to where they end up back in Mexico or California coast or Florida. So again, uh, I just mentioned this as a trivial point. In spite of what we have been taught, a butterfly will not die if scales come off its wings. The scales repel water, we should be careful. But it's not if you touch them, they're not going to survive. Now that's putting something on the wing. Here, this is an article that appeared, or part of an article that appeared in one of Paul Stoutenberg's Focus on Nature columns that he wrote for 50 years. Um, by the way, again, trivial, you can get all of the 50 years of columns on the internet. Um, I use it to search month by month in my monthly talks that I give. And you just plug in November and every article he's ever written in November. If you want to put in Peregrine Falcon, you can write that in and you'll get every article he wrote. It's very, very uh, good source. So this is an article that he wrote. And again, if you... Um, saw me give or were present at my George Rosen uh, talk. You know who he was. He was a local birder here. And you can see the red house in the background, Audubon doing its job here. Uh, George was, took workshops, honed his skills, and eventually became a licensed bird bander. And that's what we're just going to talk about here. These mist nets, fine nets, he used to put down in Moore's Woods. He had uh, about 10 or 12 of them set up in Moore's Woods during the summer. And the birds would fly in and get caught. Um, Paul Stoutenberg in his column just uh, talks about George. He gently lifts their feet from the entangling lines, a nail biting task that can only be done by master bird banders certified by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And here he is again, this is, at uh, Audubon, he was giving a talk this day uh, when he when I took this picture. And the, the, the bird is just gonna be placed in that little sack. And what you do, uh, what he did is he would walk around those 10 nets and fill up different bags with birds and then bring them back to a central station. 
And here you see the central station. He's on the left and he's able to figure out the um, first year bird, second year bird, adult bird, male, female. And what we would do is we would measure the wings, we'd weigh the bird. That's me on the right making George telling me what to write down. I was a, a neophyte and George would uh, just tell me what to do um, when we uh, recorded the birds and banded, he would ban them and then we have that information. So some of the data George recorded for each bird, age, sex, brood patch, presence of fat bodies, flight feather molt, flight feather wear, presence of juvenile and adult flight feathers on the same bird. You know, all of these things add up and they're put into the computer and you can figure out what's going on. There are uh, bands for almost every bird. There's a book that, you, uh, that he would bring and that book would tell you exactly which band to put on which bird, all different sizes. And you can see here he is putting a band on a bird and they'll stay on the bird's life, uh, stay on the bird's leg for life. He often caught re repeats, uh, two or three years in a row, he'd catch the same bird. And with all of that data, and this is the point I'm trying to get across uh, in this whole talk, with all of that data, scientists are able to establish tracks. And in this case, you see the eight major migratory bird flyways. So you can see with this kind of tagging and banding, you could establish where these birds go, when they go, et cetera. We'll look at this a little bit more in detail as we go on. This is just a small list of ways that you can put something on a bird or an animal to follow them. And you can see spray paint right in the middle, animal crayons, you know, you can write it on. If you look non-evasive, you can put on bands, you can put on tapes, streamers, bells, dyes, fluorescent pigments. If you look over on the right, you can put ear tags, wing tags, jaw tags. You can brand animals. You can remove, uh, for instance, shell notching. You can take a little feather clipping. So all of these things are ways, and, and instead of going through all of them, I just use the uh, monarch and the banding as examples, but that's one way to track animals. Another way besides the physical tags or bands are satellites. Here you see a green turtle and attached on its back is a radio signal, all right? It's going to be received by satellites. This simple diagram, the turtle comes to the surface, the antenna sends a message out, it's picked up by a satellite. The satellite sends it back down to a receiving, an antenna that can receive it. Then it's shipped over to be processed data figure it out what it is, what temperature the water is, how far it's gone, you know, salinity sometimes, all of these things can be measured. And then finally, that data is sent to a researcher who makes some sense out of it and uses it to uh, protect and perhaps enlighten the public on this particular organism. If you look at all the squiggly lines here, each squiggly line, as it says, our current tracks, I did this during the late summer, and they're tracks of loggerheads, green turtles, leatherbacks. And if I just click here for a second, I thought this was interesting. It shows the Gulf Stream, how narrow it is down in Charleston and in Jacksonville, Florida, and then it branches out and you have these little whirls here and there. But you can see a lot of the turtles like to travel along that, that pathway. Uh, a close-up, of the New York, New Jersey area down to Maryland. Um, and you can see each one of these lines is a turtle that has a, a satellite sender on its back. And each one is identified. They find out where it goes, what it likes, temperatures of water, all of those kinds of things. So again, you're tracking an animal. Besides turtles, you can do the same thing to a seal. This is a seal that was left uh, off the tip of Long Island. And if you look, and if I do this correctly, 
um, I can take this and you can see that this same um, seal came up here, went all the way around, all the way back and ended back where it started a little bit later. So again, you can get some idea of how an organism is moving. And you can see it's dated each day just about. Here's another tagged animal, one that we might be a little more fearsome of, a great white shark. Here's one that's called Cabot. And if you look over on the left, you can see its track up and down the east coast of the United States, all the way up to Nova Scotia, all the way down to Florida. This was a smaller one. It was tagged in 2000, if you look at 2018. And as I said, I was doing this during the summertime and its latest Z ping was uh, July 11th. Uh, a Z ping is just a quick ping and the other latest ping means it's on the surface for a longer time and much more data can be sent. So again, you're tracking an animal using satellite. Interestingly enough, if you look at the uh, blow up of this particular where, uh, shark, here's what it, the picture I just showed you enlarged to show where it was about three years ago. October 23rd, 2018. And you can see it came into Long Island Sound, went through all the way down to the base of Long Island Sound, made a stop in Manhasset or Great Neck. Obviously there's something wrong with that ping. It's up on the land, but you see the yellow line there. So it, it's questionable that particular dot. But obviously this one great white shark made a trip around Long Island Sound. So it gives you some information. This is another one, uh, just a female, much bigger female, 16 feet in size. And you can get, again, the yellow lines are where it spends its time. And you can see a lot of it was along the Jersey, Maryland shore. It came by Long Island a little bit, but it spent a lot of time in the open pelagic ocean at the same time. If we look at the data, this one was tagged in 2012, and it, the uh, tag lasted for five years almost to 2017. And then what happened, either it went dead or the animal died, we don't know. So again, that's the trail that you can follow. You can even put them on our ospreys. Here you can see the antenna sticking off the back, and this will fly with that with no problem. Probably the most famous one some of you might be very familiar with is North Fork Bob. If you notice the golf course is in the back, that's where he was captured, and a radio transmitter was placed on him that went for a number of years. Here's one year, 2014, in the spring. He decides to leave South America March 23rd, if you look down on the bottom. And you can see how much he's moving all the way along, jumps across in one day, jumps across to the islands, and then slowly works his way up into Florida, jumping from island to island, and then all the way up to uh, Long Island, where he came back to the North Fork. And if you look, it took maybe two and a half weeks to make that trip. A magnificent how he can do it, and how they know where to go to get back to the same place. Um, I always say, if you dropped me off in South America, would I be able to find my way home? This is in the fall, 3,387 miles. So again, you can see a fairly direct trip, knows where it's going, and ends up back down into South America. Um, Bob actually ended up um, dying in South America. They actually found him because all of a sudden his um, satellite messages were in the same place for an hour or two or three or four or five. And they said, something's happened. And they sent somebody out with um, a, a local 
a nature person down there and they found out that he had dove into a lake to try obviously to get a fish and had speared himself on a submerged um, twig. So again, you can find out those things. Um, similar to this is radio telemetry. Radio telemetry is a little bit different in that, it, again, it's using radio signals, but um, you use what's called a RD, a, some of old sailors might remember RDF, radio directional finders. And what you would do is dial the antenna around. And as the antenna signal got loud or very small, you would say that's the direction to a buoy or a lighthouse. Now they're doing it to an animal so that they can turn those antenna around in a circle and you get a, a maximum or a minimum sound and that gives you a direction. And if you do that two or three times, you can triangulate into. Nowadays, they have a little computer and you just wave that back and forth. Again, it's a directional antenna. The little computer does its job and prints out a bearing, 274 degrees. So now you know where to go and how to find the animal. This is just one example of how they use to identify four different animals and where they were over a period of time, just to show you that you can track. Um, some of you, or hopefully all of you are probably familiar with electronic toll collection where you just run through. This is almost the same thing, except in the previous cases, there was a, a transmitter on the whale. There was a transmitter on the turtle. Here, there's just like a tiny little chip. And that little chip is activated as you go through the antenna. And in this case, the chips are so small, they can even be placed inside young salmon before they start their migration. And if you look at this, this is an antenna. I put little red arrows around the antenna. And you can imagine that floating on the surface in a creek, in a river. And as these fish swim by, it's just like the cars getting their tolls taken. Each fish is counted and it'll find them a year later, two years later, if they come back after their cycle. So using the antenna, you can track which of the young salmon survive and which ones make it back. So that's a little bit about satellites and how they're used. Third, I'm gonna talk about trail cameras. Here they are, somewhere between 50 and $250. You should, everybody should get one just to put in their backyard. Um, it's fun to see who's out there uh, during the day and even more importantly, at nighttime. You know, it, it's always the fox, the raccoon, the opossum and the deer that come out in my cameras. Nothing really unusual but you get to know that these animals are around and when they come around, what time of the day, it gives you a count. It does it by uh, hours and minutes. So you know exactly uh, when that friendly fox goes by. Um, Mike Bottini has given talks to Audubon about these little guys. And um, this is one of his pictures. And this is the way he found out where many of them were and what they were doing putting a trail camera, the camera reacts to motion and it can do it during the day or during the night and it'll take a picture. Here's a little family. All of a sudden there's not one, but now there's three or four of them. So you have some sense of what's going on out there that you might not normally ever see these creatures. They're fairly, fairly uh, reclusive. I happen to see one crossing main road in Greenport one morning about 6.30 in the morning. It was just walking across the road, right in Greenport, uh, up by the light. This is what it looks like in real. I just thought you might want to see how beautiful they are. And again, here's information tracking that allowed a, a new idea of where these are. Again, this is from Mike's um, research, but it gives you an idea that he was able to track these using these cameras. Coyotes have made their invasion of Long Island. Finally, Long Island was the only place in the United States, literally, that didn't have coyotes until a few years ago. Literally the only place. And um, 
they've now made an inroad in a couple of places. Again, there's proof of their existence from these trail cameras. So again, you can track where they're going, where they've appeared, what direction they're moving. Another one, which is kind of interesting, is acoustical receivers. Acoustical being sound. You can monitor the presence of marine animals using ocean robots to collect and identify the sounds the animals make. Each animal has a different sound. So these recorders can actually um, record these sounds and identify who's swimming by. There are a couple of these colors are some of the ones that are out there, acoustical recorders. The US Navy has a lot, lot more, but they're searching for submarines, but sometimes they'll share their information at the same time in terms of whales and dolphin pods, et cetera. Um, this is what's called an Slocum electric glider. And just as it says, it's battery controlled. It'll last for three or five weeks. This particular one can dive down and go underwater and it can move along at about a knot, very small, uh, slow speeds, but then it can come up to the surface, send all its information up by satellite, and then uh, dive back down to a depth and try to find out who's down there and where they're going. A similar thing is called a wave glider. And the diagram on the left shows it. This one stays on the surface, uses solar power, so it can uh, last a little bit longer. And um, it's sending the same kind of information by uh, satellites. Apex buoys, these actually are buoyant, so they can move themselves up and down, but they can't go anywhere else. They can't move forward um, themselves. So again, they have all the sensors that are measuring water temperature, you know, the sounds associated, the distance that they're away, and the, the amount of photosynthesis sometimes, you know, the chlorophyll A in the water, all of those kinds of parameters that allow scientists to figure out why that fish is in that particular area. You can see the size of these, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, uh, again, for the same purposes. And just to give you some idea of the size of some of these things. So again, acoustical. This is diving up and down, it's measuring, comes up to the surface, sends its signal. A moored buoy does the same thing. The moored buoy stays in the same place and can give you a lot of information what, who's going by. That's how they can tell you that the number of whales in the New York Bight has increased dramatically from using this type of equipment. Besides acoustical, the actual physical tracks allow you to track. Um, I'm going to go through three or four common tracks that you might see. And in our first snowfall, you might run out and take a look and see if you remember what you hear tonight. When rabbits travel, first their small front paws touch the ground. So you see the two arrows I just put on the screen. Those are the front paws. Then the larger back feet travel over and try to picture the rabbit moving over the pores still on the ground, but the back feet catch up and land in front of the planting. So again, if you wanna know which direction they're going, the big feet in front of the small feet. So you can figure the direction, the hopping direction. And there's the big feet. Therefore, tracks of the front pores lie behind the tracks of the back pores. The distance between a set of tracks might be a few inches to over several feet when they're running, depending on the speed. So here you can see over on the right, the front paws down toward the bottom, the back paws toward the front. So you know it's going that way toward the top. 
So again, you can impress friends and neighbors. Oh, the rabbit just went that way. Raccoons, they have an interesting walk too. And uh, let me try to explain their footprints. Raccoons have a unique walking gait that they utilize when traveling and foraging. This results in a trail pattern where front and hind tracks from opposite sides of the body register next to each other. All right, this would be the front and this is the back. So they're not two front next to each other. The front and the back are, are next to each other walking. It's a little different. The rabbits, both feet were right together. The front, two front were together, the two back were together. Here with the raccoon, the one front and the opposite back end up. They're very interesting handprints. You would swear that that's a handprint in there, but um, they are raccoon prints. Another common visitor to the North Fork, deer. The easiest way to talk about them is simply the, the narrow pointed end tells you which way they're going. They're walking along and it's the, the pointed end tells you that's the way they went. Possums, you can see that long elongated when you look at the fingers. And a lot of times you will actually see the, the, the nails on them. So again, these are some of the common footprints and they'll give you a trail. They'll lead you to a den, they'll lead you to a food source. And if you're into it, there's lots and lots of people who know lots about tracks. And these are just some of the, the common fur burying animals. So that's tracks. Here's another very interesting one, radar. Obviously radar is good for picking up minor little droplets of water. That's how you get your greens and your reds and your yellows on your weather map. So if they can pick up tiny little water drops, you can imagine what happens when a duck flies by. They're gigantic targets. Uh, in this particular case, on the left bottom, you can see the difference in the size of the, the um, peaks of the graph. At the top are your tiny little passerine birds. On the bottom are bigger wader type ducks and things. And you can see there's a difference and you can measure that from the radar. This is an interesting picture and uh, take a minute to explain it. Many birds prefer to fly at night. Obviously the uh, chances of getting picked off by hawks and everything else are less. The red line that you see indicates the location of sunset at that time. If you look down on the bottom left, this is May 1st, 2020 at 2140, which is 940. So at 940, the right hand of the United States is all in darkness. The west part of the United States is still in light. That red line is the difference. And you can see the radar is fairly um, empty. Now, when I show you the East Coast. This is darkness, and these are active radars showing up birds in May. And again, you probably familiar that May is a big migration, and you can see the arrows are vectors showing which way the birds are moving. So it's kind of neat to see that they can pick this up on radar. And this again is one night and they can follow the night all the way through to find out where these are going. They can actually follow flocks across uh, states almost. This is a compilation of data over uh, nine or 10 years. And you can see in March, April, and all of a sudden the May migration comes along and it just starts to pick up. All these radars are picking up. To give you an idea what it looks like, 
This is Florida, the Keys. You might recognize the shape of it. And here's a radar. And then all of a sudden, a flock of birds shows up flies right across and off the radar into the next place. So again, they knew that there was a flock coming by. And again, this is a trivia. I thought this was kind of neat in searching things out. As Hurricane Hermione made landfall along Florida's Gulf Course, radar detected an interesting phenomenon, birds trapped inside the calm of the hurricane. So again, you know, we all, some of us might have actually stood in the center of a hurricane when it crossed over Long Island and it's sunny and clear and there's not a lot of wind. And so it turned out that the birds get trapped in there. I just thought that was a, a interesting trivial piece. So that's a little bit about radar. Obviously, probably the most important one is personal observations, the citizen science part of this. Here we see the migration of a hummingbird coming from down in Mexico, across Texas, and across the United States. Each color represents, and if you look at the dates, a different time when they first were sighted. If we make this in motion, it looks something like this. So then on March 14th, March 21st, the 28th, these are first sightings, citizens measuring, sending in, saying, I've seen a ruby-throated hummingbird. And again, that's a lot of information that scientists can use to establish when they start, when they, where they go, how they go. Is this different 10 years ago because of climate change? All of that data is stored away, and a lot of it is from citizen science. Uh, the monarchs, the same thing is done. And this is them going back down to Mexico. And again, these dates follow as they arrive in the area and move down. So again, it's their journey south, as they say. Um, just to give you some idea, the federal government actually has a list, 492. This was last year, I think, maybe this year, citizenscience.gov. And this is what the page looks like. There's about 15 pages like this, and each one of them says what it is, the status of it, who they're looking for, and where it takes place. I just picked one. American Woodcock Singing Ground Survey. Go to www.citizenscience.gov, catalog 182, and they want to know when you heard them singing, where you heard them singing. There's a whole website just for that. And as I said, there's almost 500 of these that the government has actually said these are, are good things and they're trustworthy, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a little bit about being personally involved. And one of everybody's favorites is scats, the solid waste. This is fox scat again. Knowing what it is, you can then trace a trail. You can find out where it is, which way is it going, and uh, follow it. Deer pellets, we often, I'm sure, all seen them all around. In the winter, raccoon scat, a lot of berries and berry seeds. So again, you can tell what they're eating and where they had to go to get that food. And of course, everybody needs a Diagram of Mammal Scat of, North, Scat of North America. Joyce actually has a kerchief, a scarf of this particular picture. And again, bird droppings, you know, you go out and say, oh, I wonder where a nest is. Just look on the ground underneath and you'll see all this underneath, look up and there's a nest there. Or maybe it might be a hawk's outlook spot. We've seen that where you know, the ground is just covered and, and you look up, there's no nest, it's a bare tree and a bare branch. And you know that it was an owl or a hawk that was up there um, hunting and comes back on a regular basis. And then finally, the last one, I'm just gonna do this only because this appeared in the newspapers in the last week or two. Um, 
You can use chemistry. This is the spotted lantern fly. If you're not familiar, it has been identified. It's uh, been identified on Long Island, further up uh, Western Long Island. It hasn't made it out here yet, and it is a major problem. Spotted lantern flies pose a significant threat to New York's agriculture and forest health. Adults and nymphs use their sucking mouthpiece to feed on the sap of more than 70 plant species. And on the top of the list of the top three, um, you can see the numbers of, this is when they're folded up, you don't see the same colors, but they can be very prolific, large numbers of them on any given tree. But one of the things in the top three that they love are grapes and they love great plants. Um, that's one of their favorites. The tree of heaven is another one of its favorites. And so these have just come to our area. So what, where are they? What are they doing? Um, can we trace them? Well, they've been working, trying to figure out their life cycle and habits. Where do they stay? What, where, what are they doing? And one of the ways that they've done it is that researchers at Penn, Penn State um, reported how a safe, stable isotope of nitrogen, I'll try to explain that, sprayed on host plants is ingested by the lantern flies that feed on them, thus labeling the insects so they can be readily traced for life, for egg to adult. Um, when you talk about isotopes, some isotopes are radioactive. And you really don't want to put something radioactive into uh, an animal for a long period of time. Um, these two isotopes are not radioactive. It just the one on the right, what they call heavy nitrogen, has one extra neutron. And that's the only difference. Some of you might know carbon-12 and carbon-14. They're the ones that they use to date rocks and bones. Um, they're radioactive, they change. These don't, they stay the same. And so if you spray a plant with extra nitrogen 15, heavy nitrogen, and then that's ingested by the insect, nitrogen is part of every amino acid, it's part of every protein. So it's in everybody that's, that's feeding and alive. So when that insect eats a plant that has heavy nitrogen in it, that will tell it where um, that, plant, uh, that bug has been. And they actually found out is that it's commonly found on trees and bushes that provide food and shelter and which are cooled by the overarching tree canopy. That's one of the things that came out of this. Now, just again, as a trivial point, from September through November, the female lays one or two egg masses. That's what you see on the surface of that tree. If you see any of them, scrape them off. Um, there, there's a, a lot of activity. You can read all about how they're trying to block this from getting any further. And that's a little bit about tracking. Just to give you an idea, there's 118 birds in this diagram. So you can imagine all of the people, all of the scientists, all of the equipment that have been put together, collated to show the annual migration of these 118 or 19 birds. So here's one year and then it'll start again. If I put, whoops, let me go back. Um, it should. There it goes, just to show. And each bird, you can identify the birds and they show you how they migrate. Now, again, this is an integration of all the things that I've talked about and how they're able to analyze. And you can see the, the spring migration where all those are up in May and now they're coming down in September, October. So again, that is the last slide. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Thank you, John. That was amazing. Yes, uh, you're welcome to put your questions on the chat or just ask away. I, I had a question from early on in the, in the presentation. 
that seal, the gray seal, Yarmouth, is that England? Did it go all the way? Where no, 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 uh, Nova Scotia. Yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure. Okay. Yeah, Yarmouth is a port on the west side. Right. That's where the ferry goes to. From yeah, no, it didn't get that far, Peggy. That was like, wow. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, we have a question from Margaret. Um, generations of monarchs going north. Uh, it semi-depends. What happens is the mass of uh, monarchs that are in Mexico, they start off and some of them will go up the central flyway, some of them will go along the east coast. What normally happens is they're following milkweed. Milkweed is part of their cycle. And just let me go off for one minute. Um, the monarchs lay eggs on milkweed. The caterpillars will eventually eat the leaves of the milkweed and they produce a poison. And that poison is kept in the caterpillar and then ends up in the uh, butterfly itself. And if a bird, I've seen a movie of a blue jay eating a uh, monarch, and after about 10 seconds, it's coughing and coughing. There's a poison in it that prevents the birds. And once one of them, once a bird has eaten one, they'll stay away from all of them because it's very uncomfortable. So what happens is the um, butterflies will move over to Texas. And Texas is now the a place where the plant is growing and they'll lay their eggs there and then they'll die off. And then the next generation is born and they'll move up to uh, South Carolina and they do the same thing. And then they'll move up to uh, New Jersey and then they'll move up. And at the end, it, it, there's sometimes four generations, sometimes five, they'll stop in that last generation, no one knows why or how or how it's triggered. That last generation says, oh, I've got to go back to Mexico. So when I say there's three or four or five generate, it depends on how far up they get. The days start getting shorter. There's no more milkweed usually above Maine or so. And so um, they start to migrate back. So there's a few generations going up. Those generations don't live. It's only that last generation that somehow knows it's got to go all the way back. All right, next. Great white sharks in Long Island Sound is alarming. Is there a website? Um, I, I, there is. I, I'm just, if, if I go back on that slide, I can, and uh, let me just look for a second here. Um, Yes, there, there's a number of sites that if I can't find it here, um, there's a number of sites that have, you know, this doesn't give the, the title of it. Um, but if you go on uh, Google following great white sharks, you'll get, uh, there's three or four different organizations that have um, telemetry on these sharks. Same thing with the turtles, same thing with uh, all of these. So uh, I don't see, I don't have the title right there. Anybody else? Never knew that butterflies thought one made the whole flight. Yep. The last generation flies all the way back. I have a question um, that you, you brought up that page of citizen science projects that right. were looking for data. Right. What was the website for that again? Was it citizen science? Uh, uh, I, you know, I was going to make up at the end, Peggy, a sheet of all the websites. Ah. I said I don't know how to put it all. Let me just find it, and it's the easiest way. So, those, so each of those. Um, little pages that you showed that that's that's different organizations looking for specific data right um specific projects that was interesting yeah let me just i'm trying to find out where oh here 
you know, and it's hidden. I'm so, that's why I couldn't find it. It's behind this um, this box here. And if I get rid of this, each one of those boxes is a different one. Um, I'm just trying to, you can look, you know. And this website is, this is one is, website. Uh, it's www.citizenscience.gov. Okay, .gov. Catalog, if you want. www.citizenscience.gov backslash catalog. Thanks. Um, there was a question, what kind of camera? There's several makes of camera. Again, if you Google um, trail cameras, there's several companies that make them. And as I say, they range from $50 to $500 if you want. Um, but just Google trail cameras. And they're all for daytime and nighttime. Did I answer your question, Peggy? Yeah, Paul had a question. Uh, on those trail cameras, every time I see them, they have... Uh bright spots on the light on the eyes. Do they use flash or are they infrared? No, it's infrared. I thought so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's infrared and that's what you're getting. It's just more um, blood on the surface. Huh. You know, it's like that red eye that you get in cameras. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much, John. That was really wonderful. I hope it was enjoyable. And everyone, I, we hope to see you on December 5th for our second annual Authors' Night with Scott. Yeah, you know, just yeah. Peggy, I think yeah. well, when we got, I got your email. There's a new message here. Um, uh -huh. um, when I got your email, um, we, I, I'm almost 99% positive that we have something that, you know, our busy social calendar, that's the one night that we have something. But I'll get back to you on that. We can record it. So anyway. All right, everyone. So, so uh, great to see you all. And thank you all for joining us. Have a good night. Thank you, Peggy. Thanks, John. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.